Guys, today I wanna to talk about the intricacies of the hamstrings, the glutes, and the quadriceps, understanding the complex ways that these muscles work together to move you through space is integral to troubleshooting your technique and to solving problems in training as they pop up. And as you start to understand how this stuff fits together, you might actually be surprised about some of the implications it has for your training. Now, this actually all started out as a glute video. I wanted to do a deep dive into what the glutes do, why they're important, why they're necessary to be a well-rounded lifter and athlete, and what to do if your glutes aren't responding or if you're having trouble getting them to grow. We are still going to get into that. You can meet me back here in a couple of days and I will have that finished for you. But in getting to that, I had to first explain all of this and I started getting way off the trail. So I thought we would do a video on this first and this will set you up nicely for that glute discussion that's gonna come down the pike. Now we all know people who break the mold when it comes to the prototypical lifter. Certainly big squatters typically have very big thighs. Certainly big deadlifters have very thick developed hamstrings and both of those athletes typically have very well-developed glutes because hip extension is so vital on success in both of those lifts. But we know people that don't fit that category. I can think of very good squatters that have been deficient in their glutes, in their quadriceps. I've known very big deadlifters that have been deficient in their hamstrings or their glutes, and that kind of defies reasoning. But as we get into this, you'll see the ways that your body can kind of work around that, and hopefully it'll give you some ideas on how to correct course when things do start to get a little bit lopsided. Real quick, I wanna give a shout out to Barbell Apparel. They sent me a care package of some of the most comfortable clothing I have ever put on, period. The jeans are so comfortable and stretchy that you can do literally any workout with complete comfort. I can do a clean, a snatch, I could deadlift, and they don't sacrifice durability. These aren't jeggings, like it's denim. It feels like denim. It just has the right amount of give, super comfortable. And these joggers came just at the right time because it's like 25 degrees here in South Texas. So I was super excited to throw these on this morning. So thank you, Barbell Apparel. Go ahead and check those guys out if you're looking for some quality training gear. I really do look forward to working with those guys more in the future. Getting back into this, we're gonna evaluate how this stuff works by looking at the two basic movement types that we do in athletics and in lifting with the lower body, and that is hinging and squatting. Hinging is essentially just moving at the hip joint. So anytime you're talking about going from this hinged bent over position to snapping to lockout, it's the hips moving forward, and that happens by contraction from the main movers, the glutes and the hamstrings. Everything's anchored on to your pelvis, and it pulls to lever your torso up. That's how that movement goes down. Now, when we move into a squat, we're adding in an element of complexity. Now the knee is flexing as you move into the lower position. So on the way down, if you start standing, the hip flexes like so, but also the knee flexes, and that changes where tension is placed in some of these muscles. See, the hamstring crosses two joints. It crosses your hip and it crosses your knee. So it can be moving at one, but as long as there's give at the other, it maintains this, this kind of steady tension. As you move into a bent over position, as you flex the hips, you get that stretch through the back of your leg. But if you're in that hip flex position and then you flex your knees as if you're going down into a squat, you'll notice that your hamstrings become slack. They lose that stretch, they lose that tension. So as you're moving through a squat, you'll notice that the hamstrings aren't going through a stretch shortening cycle like other single joint muscles do. Your quadriceps, or most of the muscles of your quadriceps that just go over the knee, as you flex your knee, they stretch. As you extend your knee, they contract. And it's that simple back and forth. Your hamstrings do not go through that movement. So the rectus femoris actually operates the same way. Most of the quadricep muscles just go over the knee, but the rectus femoris goes all the way up, crosses over the hip. So that's used in hip flexion. So if you're lifting your leg up, if you've ever tried to do an L-sit, you know your legs, your quads start to shake, that's why. Now, if we consider how these antagonist muscles work, we start to run into a paradox because it looks as if the effort of the muscles should cancel each other out and that there should be no net movement. As the hamstrings contract, you're getting hip extension, but you're also getting knee flexion. Knees flex, hip extended, like at the top of a glute ham raise, that's the most fully contracted position in the hamstring. So you're getting a force almost like you're kicking your knee back. Well, that's the opposite of what's going on in a squat. When the rectus femoris contracts, you're getting 
directly oppositional movement. This contraction wants to flex the hip and it wants to extend the knee. So the actions are almost equal and opposite. They move in the opposite direction. So why is it that the knee actually extends even though the hamstring is putting an opposite force? Why is it that the hip extends even though the rectus femoris is putting an opposite force? So the solution to Lombard's paradox actually has to do with the moment arm of each muscle at its point of insertion. So imagine that you have like a really heavy metal gate. It weighs like a thousand pounds and you have to attach a rope to it to help swing it open. Well, if you attach the rope really close to the hinge joint, you're gonna have to pull really, really hard to get that thing moving. But if you attach it further down towards the end, further away, that longer moment arm means a bigger force is going to be generated for the same amount of effort. So you don't have to pull very hard to get that thing to swing all the way open. Same principle when we're looking at how muscles attach to the joints. Basically, the more purchase a muscle gets by being placed further away from the pivot point, it generates more force, so you get a bigger net force. Essentially, the hamstrings have much greater purchase at the hip, so they win out at the hip extension, and the rectus femoris gets much greater purchase at the knee, so it wins out on the knee extension. Now, that's just an interesting note on the complexity of how the lower body functions and operates. There's not a lot of actionable information there. But if we start to consider how these two joint muscles, these biarticulate muscles work in conjunction with their single joint antagonists, we get into some pretty interesting territory, and it's gonna explain why we utilize certain developmental movements as opposed to others. So in addition to the hamstrings involved in hip extension, we also have the glutes. Single joint muscle, pure hip extension, that's all the glutes do. Similarly, most of the muscles in the quadriceps are single joint, it's just the rectus femoris that goes over both joints. That just involves itself with knee extension. Now, if we consider the relationship between a single joint muscle and its two joint antagonist, this is, this is where the weird stuff happens. I want you to imagine that your hamstring is just a string. Imagine that there, there's no force being produced. It's just a loose string. That's all it is. We've already established that as you squat down, the hamstring goes a little slack and the quadriceps get stretched. You know, you get that tension in the quads. Now, as the quads start to contract, you're getting knee extension. And as that knee extends, that string starts to get shorter and shorter until all the way at the end, that quadriceps snaps your knee to lock out and that's where the string is at the absolute tightest at the top. What that means is that the movement generated by these single joint muscles actually affects how the two joint antagonists work to get you to lock out. In this example, the quadriceps actually strap themselves to the hamstrings. They work in conjunction. So as the hamstring contracts isometrically to maintain its rigidness, it is the work done by the quadriceps that causes the hamstring to, to tighten and to extend the hip. So basically the quads working at this joint helps you extend at that joint. Now the interesting thing is that the equal and opposite thing happens on the other end when you consider the glutes working with the rectus femoris. So every bit of hip extension that's created by the glute muscle is going to cause the knee to extend at the other end by virtue of the rectus femoris shortening. So the glutes are going to contract to extend the hip. The end result is that slack gets taken out of the rectus femoris and that helps to extend the knee. So this shows us a couple things. It shows us that success in squatting and deadlifting has just as much to do with the communication between these different structures as it does with any one structure being strong. There's some wisdom to taking your strong points and making them stronger, but in the face of this big asymmetry, this uneven development, you are going to severely limit your potential to move weight because you just won't be efficient. This illustrates how important, obviously, the quads are to something like squatting, but also why the hamstrings are important because they do the job together. You can't really get a good completed lift unless all of the muscles are doing their job to the fullest extent of their capabilities. Now, we want to acknowledge that we normally take for granted that these movements are good developers, and it's important to recognize that and to start to pick apart why they develop you so that we can solve problems because you can prescribe squatting for a thousand people and a thousand people might get a little more muscular and a little stronger but over time as they get better and better just squatting isn't going to be enough for most of them some will develop in kind of an even well-rounded way and as long as they're putting in effort and growing they stay pretty balanced 
Some others are going to get huge asymmetries and they're, they're gonna get very developed in one part and maybe underdeveloped in another. And that's not ideal for being the best possible lifter or athlete that you can be. So if we're gonna break this stuff apart and try to guess why certain muscles develop really well with some movements and why different lifters will develop in different proportions from doing the same movements, we can start to look at the way these muscles work and get an idea of what we can expect developmentally. If we look at single joint movements, they go through a stretch shortening cycle, it's very obvious. As a muscle contracts, the joint extends. As the joint flexes, because the antagonist is contracting, this muscle stretches back and forth. It's very easy to see. Now the hamstrings, on the other hand, go through something a little more complex, because when you're standing up, they're shorter at the hip and they're stretched at the knee. And then as you squat, that actually flips because the hip flexion now stretches the hamstring at the top, whereas the knee flexion shortens the hamstring at the knee. Now somewhere in that swap, you get some amount of net tension that leads to this hip extension we talked about, but it isn't obvious. And that explains why the hamstrings are not usually thickened out. They're not usually made really big and strong by something like squatting. Now you can argue that squat modifications might work that a little bit better if you involve less knee movement and more hip movement, like with somebody who has a very wide, very hip dominant bent over squat, that extra hip extension is only going to happen if there is more net tension being generated in the hamstrings and of course the glutes. So that might be a better approach. Anything that pulls the hamstrings tight is going to create a bigger stress that's going to cause that muscle to grow and get stronger. So there are some power lifters specifically that look to get a very wide spread with their knees to where you almost feel like you're squatting into your adductors. And when you feel the hamstring get pulled tight at the bottom, you know that there's a lot more concentric, eccentric going on throughout the entire movement than with a traditional high bar squat with your hamstrings being a lot more slack throughout most of the movement. That's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't already, go ahead and check me out on Patreon. That's where I upload my workouts daily with commentary so you can see how I put this stuff into practice in real time. It's also the easiest way to get in touch with me if you have a question, if you have an idea for a video. So go ahead and check out Patreon. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Till next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.